Courageous 
changing, resembling a bell torn apart. Hear all the cries she's making, keeping the beats of my heart. Children of promise, be strong and courageous. Whoa, a time for revival. Control, control. here are the facts. Like the shepherd and the sheep shall be scattered. We're the scattered few. You died for me a lonely man. Show me his love again and again. You can't hide the fact that he loves you. I'm here to tell you what to do. I think it's cool for me. Well, how about you? You died at 73. Your love is true. Your tears are crossed and shed his blood. Showed me a love that's from above. The penny ball was for my sin. And I will be with him again. You think it's cool for me. Well, how about you? You died at 73. God give us life God give us life God give us life God give us life You think it's cool for me Well how about you You died in 73 In love is true 
So, so how did you like your life flash before your very eyes <laughs> in the last two and a half minutes? Yeah, or more? <laughs> yeah no doubt, huh? Hey, I have no idea what's going on with Facebook. I tried over and over and over. Fo Facebook is not letting us broadcast. And I do this like every day, every week for like a long time. So I have no idea why it's not letting that account broadcast. So apologies to those that are trying to uh, get on Facebook. I, po I posted a link to the Travelog Network YouTube account. So... Sorry about that. Technical difficulties completely out of my control. Completely. Hey, my name's Alan McGuire, formerly known as uh, Rumble Dumpkiss. We don't, we don't, we don't say that word anymore. Uh, I was the primary, you know, I was the the vocalist, um, principal songwriter, and the architect of this thing we call Scattered Few. This is my brother Omar Dumpkiss, my mother's son. Bass player, extraordinaire, co-writer, background singer of Scattered Few. And literally 40 years ago today, we went to the recording studio to record that song you just heard, plus another song that Omar wrote and sang called Death. And um, we made a cassette. No. It, it was you. Was it you? Oh, the original you. Oh, that's right. Hey, we're knocking. You don't care. That's right. Your bubble, yeah. your Jello Biafra. Je Jello Biafra. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> your Jello Biafra vocal. That's right. That's right. It wasn't death. Yeah. And uh, we took that. We took <laughs> oh, that classic. CD. We we took that two song cassette. And um, well, here we are. Um, but before we get track, into maybe. what's that? A track. Oh man. So before we get into all of that, uh, just a couple things. We want this to be as interactive as possible in this medium. So we have moderators out here. We have moderators here. Go ahead and please ask your questions. Put a capital Q in the front of it so the moderators can see it and feel them. And they're sending, they're feeding them to us. And then we'll 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 actually you know, man. And but we've 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 got uh, well. I think we have a lot to talk about. I think I think this is going to be a lot of fun. I don't. We've never really have done this before. Um, I figured. It was the 40th anniversary, like literally today, this week. So why not, right? And we've got all these groovy new re releases and remasters. So anything before we start, Omar, that you'd like to share? No. No, all right. What, whatever people want to know, man. Yeah. So the... Let's let's be, well, let's touch a little bit on why we started it, like briefly, because I want to kind of go ahead and go back um, a few years before that point and talk about like how did we get into even Christian rock? How did that even happen? You know what I mean? Uh, what did you know? What did we listen to, or how did you know? How were we exposed to Christian rock? So, but hello everybody, hello hello hello. Um, so. I got, I was gone, and we're going to get to that, but I got, I came back to the United States of America in, in early February of 1983, and if you think about that, it's absolutely, completely mind-blowing to me that within three to four weeks, we wrote those two songs and got into the studio and recorded them, and uh, I, re I remember, uh, we, we were just talking about this before the show, we, we I called a good friend of mine that I went to school with that were still buddies. And I said, hey, I need a drum set. And he, and he lent us, uh, I'm going to say, was it just a four piece maybe? But at least, you know, maybe four piece, maybe five piece. But it was a pearl, a white pearl drum set that he let us borrow to record those two songs. And there's a picture in that opening video, uh, my backs, you know, Omar's backs to the camera. And there's like, there's three of us on a church stage or whatever you want to call it up on the platform of a church and we're literally working out that song and you with louis uh, an, an old family friend lou beccaria played lead guitar on you and there's an actual photo of us working out and hashing out that song with the three of us where we're like wearing t-shirts it looks like it's nighttime in that church and some of you you've you probably have seen the picture of of scattered few around a church marquee with Terry Taylor, that church. And then the uh, the picture that I love, my favorite picture of, of you and I, Omar, is on the porch of mom and dad's house. And you're, you're on the guitar. 
It's like a classic. It's like a six strong nylon, six string nylon. And I, I believe we're literally writing while reprobate. I believe that. Probably. I think that's the song we were writing then. So, but to begin with, so I let's well, let's just jump back. So I I was I left I, I left the United States of America in January of 1980. I was a I was a punk rock kid. Um, I was active in the scene. I was working in the scene. I was literally in a band with Don Bowles uh, from the Germs. So if you if you watch the decline of Western civilization, the first one, the only one that really counts, the first one, the decline of Western civilization, it's a documentary on the Los Angeles punk rock scene, and it was filmed and came out in 1980. Well. That's the scene I was involved with that got me on a one-way ticket under false pretenses to a third world country <laughs> to live with a missionary uncle. So I literally disappeared for three years. Uh, I had, like I said, I was, in a, I was 15 in a band with Don Bowles. We had just tracked two songs and he was going to hand walk it, you know, walk, hand deliver it to Rodney Bingenheimer at K-Rock. And apparently, you know, it was going to go good because it was a drastic, what happened to me was drastic and, the, and it cut me off from that reality. But that's, that's where I found Jesus. That's how I got saved and it changed my life. And I, I, I have no regrets. But while I was gone, so when I left, neither, neither of us were in, were in the faith. And um, so Omar, what happened? What, what did you do between 1980 and 1983? The only thing I know is this. I know you went to the Lighthouse Ranch at one point, uh, an actual Jesus movement compound that was in Northern California that our, our uncles were at. Um, not to jump on, the, on, the, on this new uh, Jesus movement revolution bandwagon that is <laughs> literally going nuts right now. But I know, I know that, and I know somehow you got into faith. I'm not quite sure how that happened. But I remember showing up in the summer of 81 briefly for a couple months. And you were playing stand-up bass for the L.A. Junior Philharmonic. And you yeah. go and you went and, and you took me to one of your rehearsals and you and I watched and I was in awe of what you were doing at the age of 81. You would have been 15. Yeah, I think so. Eight, so before <laughs> was 18. So three oh, is 17, two is 16. <laughs> You're, I'm making you do math. Is 15? I was 17. So yeah, you, you would have been 15. And then at the end of the rehearsal, you said, hey, come here and check this out. And you started playing me like, I don't know, man, 32 note runs or something. It was nuts. That's all I know. So please tell us how, you know, how, you know, don't take an hour, but how did you get saved? How did you come to Messiah and your introduction to Christian rock? Um, I, I don't, I don't remember. Um, I, I just, I know that I was in, I was in junior high and, you know, doing all the things you're not supposed to do in junior high, like smoking weed and drinking Southern Comfort. <laughs> um, and I was playing, uh, um, the, the bass that we recorded that two song demo on that, um, it was a Hondo uh cheapy like knockoff of a p bass that i got at colleen music and that's the one that i played um with you you know jamming with you and louie in the garage um all those years ago so i was playing bass i got involved in uh at school because uh the band director at the time keith Myatt, came into the music appreciation class and said do you play an instrument and i said i play bass and I showed up to think I'm going to play electric bass and I show up there and he hands me an upright and I was like, I've never played something, you know, any of the, this ever before. So, um, just started in a hallway with a music stand and a beginning music book, a bow and the bass and just hammering out in the hallway, how to bow and how to play, how to read music. And two weeks later I was playing with the orchestra in, in school and getting involved in like the jazz band and stuff. But somewhere around, I'd have to say around eighth grade, I guess, I just decided to, I don't know how it, I don't know how it happened, but I started, you know, 
being a person of faith kind of thing. Right. And well, um, before you jump there, there's a couple of questions for you. How, how did you get started playing fretless? Um, because I played upright bass. Right. So Literally. it's one plus I one mean, equals two. The original, the original <laughs> fretless, man. Sure. So I always thought that it was a beautiful sound. I loved the way it sounded. And electric fretless was eventually going to be the next progression because I wanted to have the electric reality, but at the same time have that that in-between note thing that you get with fretless that you can't get right. on a fretless. So so Chris, Chris, again, Chris asked that question. He's also asking your bass influence. He's, he says Jocko, I'm sure. Yeah, but uh, more, more than Jocko would be Percy Jones from Brand X. And mm -hmm. he also, my first exposure to his playing was uh, Before and After Science by Brian Eno. Um, 1978, Before so, and After Science. Yeah, so you, you have that, but then, you know, consider all the, you know, James Jamerson, all, all of the great bass players from the 70s that everybody would 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 cite as uh, influence. Uh, Rocco from Tower of Power, you know, what is hip, that, that bass line alone will kill you. Um, and then you have like, you know, the, the, the bands from like, you know, War, uh, Slave with their album Slide, which was oh my gosh. freaking brilliant. Um, Everything, everything ever played on any Bowie album up until, you know, just, well, period. But, you know, mostly all up of the to Lodger, ones, yeah. which are, you know, uh, um, Trevor Boulder. Yep. A lot of, you know, all those early albums of Trevor Boulder. And I then was... it goes from Trevor to Tony. Right. Dude, Spani, dude, which dude, forget it, you know. Trevor Boulder's playing was like distortion or at least overdrive. And he's just like pounding. It's like if you listen to... The width of a circle from the Ziggy Stardust movie, Trevor Boulder, dum, 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 he's got overdrive on it. And dude, you can hear Daryl Jennifer in there. Oh, it's, it's, you know, I just, you know, so there's, there's all those, there's all those influences, but you also have, you know, classical music, which, you know, mm -hmm. I can't really cite any bass players, but then you have jazz. So you've got um, Charles Mingus, you've got Ray Brown, you've got, um, um, Someone's asking Carol Kay. Yeah, because you know, um, look at everything that she played on, right? Um, um, uh, do, 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 the Beach Beach Boys, right? Um, that's supposed to be her. Doom, doom, ba -doom, doom. That's a that's a brilliant bass line, and that's her playing, you know, with a pick, and and yeah, all those, all those. Early players are all influences right. because so, that's all you're listening to on the radio. So Chris says that you influenced him to rip his frets out of his bass about 30 years ago. Yeah. No regrets. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So you're you're playing bass guitar. You're playing you're playing fretless because you 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 had your first experience was with the uh, stand up. So no, it was it, no 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 it was it well was, yeah it was the well, traditional fretless. electric yeah. right. But because of yeah. your work in the Philharmonic with the fretless, you know, with a stand-up bass, you decided to go with a fretless. And around eighth grade, you came to faith, muscle metal. You said around eighth grade. Yeah, somewhere in that, in that time frame, you know, just started living a believer's life, whatever. Yeah, which is after um, I left. And, um, you know, got involved in, like, you know, being, you know, strong for your belief in school and, you know, I'm not reading Grapes of Wrath because it said, God damn it, in it, you know, and I'm not, you can't make me read that book and you can't fail me. I'll take your job. So I read the Chronicles of Narnia instead. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, you know, stuff like that. And, yeah. and then, um, and, you know, trying to be, you know, good, good old Christian boy. Right. Um, what about, uh, so, so how did you get involved with Christian music? Um, I don't really remember how that came about, but I know that there were bands to go see, like, um, I went to go see a band called the Lifters. They were like a rockabilly. Uh, they were like a rockabilly, yeah. They, they were, they were like, you know, the, because the Stray Cats were big at the time and these guys were doing a three piece. Mm -hmm. Not, not that I want to compare like that because I think comparisons like that suck, but they were a rockabilly group, right? A three piece rockabilly group, but mm -hmm. they were also doing gigs at the time. And so was, so was Alter Boys. Mm -hmm. So it was undercover. Well, wait, wait, um, what year are we talking about now? We're talking about 82? 82, 
82-ish, I guess. Right, maybe. right before I showed up. 80, yeah, 82 is as early as you're going to get. 81 into 82, but probably more so 82, where I went and saw, I, I know I went and saw the Alter Boys a couple times, and I think I saw Undercover somewhere. And while I really appreciated what they were doing musically, it bothered me that people were referring to them, all those acts, as being um, punk rock, because I know different. <laughs> <laughs> you're you're, you're, and, going, you're um, getting ahead of me. I know, I know, but I was just like, eh, whatever, okay, I'll just let it go because it was something, you know. Because prior to that, what was uh, plus I, at that time frame, right? I was going to Calvary Chapel, so I was seeing Resurrection Band, I was seeing Phil Keggy, I was seeing. Um, Sweet Comfort. I was going to say Southern Comfort. That's funny. Sweet Comfort. Um, you know, all those type of bands. Those were all like, you know, oh, here we go with the whole, the whole J movie thing, you know, that's going on right now. That all of that, those music, you know, plus, you know, I had tapes of Love Song, The Way, Second Chapter of Acts, um, Second Chapter of Acts Live with Phil Keggy, the What A Day album, um, you know, all that kind of stuff. So, I mean, it was there, but yeah. So, okay. So I, I, I'm sent, I'm, I'm sent away to live with a missionary uncle in 1980 in a central, in Central America. And so I'm, a, he's, so he starts feeding me, you know, Christian music. Uh, like you said, you know, love song, the way Chuck Gerard, you know, all those old guys, Keith Green, because it's 1980. I forgot about Green. Yeah, 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 it's 1980, Keith Green. But he also has Daniel Amos. So I'm listening. So he's, so he's playing me Dr. Shotgun Angel. Angel, right? And there's literally nothing for me to listen to. I mean, I have no music that's, that's for, you know, for myself. Um, I'm, a, I'm a Bowie kid gone to punk rock, new wave, and... There's nothing to listen to at all. And, and my, my, my uncle's like one of the original Jesus Movement hippie guys, so he's not going to have anything like that. Um, well, there's nothing. I mean, it's not like he's, it's 1980, so it's not like he's going to have anything. He's not, you know, about the cars or, you know, Lena Lovich or the B-52s or Devo or any of the punk rock that was out by 1980. And it was a considerable amount of music by 1980. At that time, you also have Boy and... and uh... Well, October. just about, right. But I'm in Guatemala, right? So we're know, not going to hear you anything about you too till 1981. <laughs> right. So, so he's playing. But here's the thing. He played me. Whoa. Okay. Hey, we got, we got, we got some sort of um, scam going on Facebook, sending people to an external site that has you sign up for a free account, then charged a dollar, uh, and then, which will news at $50 that, a month in five days. So I'm being, re that's, that I'm being told that right now. So I have no idea how that happened, because my accounts, I don't have, I don't know. I don't know what's going on. I, I don't have time to look into it. I'll look into that in a minute. Okay, so, but here's something I did recognize when it came to um, can hey, can you moderators go into the that Facebook and delete whatever it is that you guys are talking about um, on on the Facebook page? So I did notice a, there was there were moments on Shotgun Angel that told me that wow, um, there's something about these guys that. You know, they, they, they're, they're doing some, you know, stuff like the Whistler and he's going to do a number on you, things like that. There's a, I'm getting a post here. Hold on. There's something weird. Netstreamlive24.com. So. Yeah, that's that link that they were trying to send people to. Yeah. Weird. So, so is it, a, so is it, is it a post? Did somebody just post on Facebook something like that? You know what? I should probably go. Let me. Let me just. Let me. I'll. I'll talk and and go in there and see what I can do to kill it. So there were there was there were moments on Shotgun Angel that were like, wow, this is amazing stuff. 
there's some really good stuff on, on here. But, you know, that was about it. And then in 1981, I end up coming to the, the States. And I, I come back to the States. I spent like a, I don't know, a couple of weeks in, the, in, in, in California. But on the way to California from, uh, we, drove, I, we drove from Guatemala, you know, through Mexico, through Texas. And as we cut across the, the States, we stopped uh, in, in Arizona at a friend of my uncle's place. And we went to a... Um, Wow, there's something really weird going on. And then we stopped at we stopped off at a Christian Christian bookstore. I've never been, it was in a mall. I've never had I've never been to a Christian bookstore before because again I wasn't saved before going to Guatemala. So this was a new phenomenon to me. I had never been to a Christian bookstore in my life, and um, so. Um, I, so I remember my cousin and I, he's a couple years younger than us, he, uh, we, we, we walked out with the new Barnabas, the first Barnabas. We walked out with that. I think we had Lifesavers, us kids, and then, um, what should we call it, had been released. A horrendous Disc and Alarma had come out at the same time. So I immediately gravitated to that because, you know, I, I knew about Daniel Amos. Didn't you grab uh, Andy McCarroll and Moral Support? Right. Yeah, the Zionic Bonds. Andy McCarroll and the Zionic that's Bonds. It. Yeah, we, we got, I got that one as well. And that's, that's about it. Album. Yeah, that was about it. And, and so we went back, and that's when, you know, so we had something to listen to. Let me, but let me put it this way. Daniel Amos's Alarma was more new wave than anything that was being peddled as Christian punk between 1980 and 1983, roughly 1984. It just, that's, just, that's just the truth. And, 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 and it's, it's yeah, easy to know. determine that. I mean, all you have to do is go and listen to actual punk rock and then what Christiani was putting out. There's no comparison. And, and then we, were, we, we learned about U2. And I remember we, we were, because we, we were subscribing to fanzines, and we were able to buy Boy and October right after October came out. So we were pretty early when it came to that whole U2 thing. That was like an 81-ish, I believe. So when I came back, so, so now it's, you know, it's 1983, we come back, I come back to the U.S., and I start going to a church that Omar was already going to in our hometown of Burbank, California, and um, one of the elders approached me, and I, I mean, I, we, I, I, was, I was barely there three or four weeks before we went to the studio to make the demo. And one of the elders had approached me and said, hey, you know, we're really interested in doing some sort of, you know, youth outreach. Um, what would you do when it, if, when it comes to youth outreach? I go, well, I, I'd start a band. <laughs> you know, I'd, 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 I'd go after the youth through music because that's just what you do. That's what the youth are, are all about it. And he, goes, and, I, and he goes, well, what kind of music? I go, well, I would go back to my own. Since I'm an old punk rocker, I'd go, I'd, I would do that. And then he's, that's when he said, well, what would it cost? To, you know, what, what would you need to do and what would it cost? And I go, well, we, we need a demo. And so he put us in the, so he, he funded the studio recording. So Omar and I got together. We sat down and we hashed out these two songs went to the studio 40 years ago today, and that's the, the two-song demo. And uh, so why did we start Scattered Few? So I, I, I have always said that the reason why we started Scattered Few was be, for two reasons. One, there wasn't, there wasn't anything in Christianity that was punk rock, that did punk rock music. And, and at the same time, the only, the only band that existed in 1983 that was like punk rock, that was really punk rock, that had any sort of a positive lyrical content was a band from Washington, D.C. called The Bad Brains. They were quoting scripture. Um, it was, it was positive, you know, a lot of it was positive. And, um, but, but they were Rastafarians. So, that's why, we, that's why we started the band. So, another thing that happened, here's, a lot of people don't know this. Another thing that happened was this. We, 
we started a whole, we started a uh, an outreach to the homeless homeless uh, punk rock youth that would congregate on Hollywood Boulevard on the weekends. They were homeless. They were living in abandoned hotels. Um, it was pretty much a, you know, a pretty dire, dire situation for a lot of the homeless kids, the homeless punk rock kids in Hollywood. And they were, a lot of them were our age. I was, I had, I had just turned 19. Omar had just turned 17 uh, in February. And then we went to the studio and made the demo. So we, w we started a homeless outreach. We started an outreach for the homeless youth, punk rock youth of Hollywood. And we leveraged that with a band called Scattered Few. A lot of people don't remember that or they don't know that, but that's, those are the primary reasons why Scattered Few started. There was no, Christ, there was no punk rock for Christians, um, but then as an outreach, there was no punk rock like there was in the Jesus movement. In the Jesus movement, everybody was playing the music of the times. Right. I mean, whatever was whatever was happening in 1969, 70, 71, 72, 73, those Christian bands were, were sounded like their secular contemporaries. That wasn't necessarily so when it came to what was happening um, in Christian rock and, you know, alternative punk rock, whatever you're calling it in 1982, 83, 84. So well, which is why we started the music What's that? from that, the, all those bands back then. Right. That was all Orange County. Mm -hmm. So yes, there's it was. a whole, that was a whole different. And it, and it was around Calvary Chapel. Yeah, but it was a whole different way of thinking about. It was. Music. If, if, um, if you know what I mean? Like to, to an extent, what, yeah. What their view of what, let's say, harder music was, was I think a little different. But, you know, that's just my opinion at the time. Sure. So, you know. So well, that's crazy though, right? And so I mean, back then we were going as a band, you know, and a group of other people. We would go to Hollywood Boulevard and we were witnessing to people. We were passing out chick tracks, which was the funniest thing on earth because you know those things are just so not relevant to some degree. And so we started trying to make our own tracks, um, and going around and you know witnessing to people and you know at certain times you and Pellerin for for example you know getting beat up <laughs> I remember Pellerin getting punched I mean smack dab right there just boom and his head just went back and he came back up like this and he looked at the guy and goes what's going on <laughs> just didn't even affect him at all I mean yeah. talk about being protected <laughs> That was crazy. Good, good memories. That, but that code, that that time was the same time that we went to the wig factory, providing food. Right. So for, for, for the homeless youth. You know. Right. So we're we're hanging out in Hollywood. We're hanging out on Hollywood Boulevard. The 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 um. Oh man. He was the singer for Circle One, well, John. Sure. Yeah, John. No. Yeah, yeah I'm getting there. there. But we all yes. hung out. Right, the the scene. We all hung out at um, what was that name of that club? We all hung out at. Everybody. I don't remember. I was, it was on Argyle. It was like one know. main club we all hung out at. All the punks. It was like the main punk rock club, the Cathy de Grand. That was like the main venue for the most part where we all hung out. It's 1983. Now you got to remember the kind of music that was being played in 1983 when it came to punk rock, which is why it was so, which is why the music that the Christians were showing up on Hollywood Boulevard distributing as Christian punk rock made it so difficult for us because it didn't compare in any way, shape, or form to what was being listened to by these punks. You know, you're talking about, besides suicidal, I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a given. Suicidal, bad brains. You had, um, oh my gosh, SSD control from Boston. That was amazing. Aggression. Scream. Aggression. They were all skin, ex former uh, uh, skinheads, like literally Nazi punks. Uh, they were they were part of Nash, North American skinheads. Uh, both aggression DRI. and neighborhood threat. Um, all the Oxnard bands, DRI. Um, who else? Land of No Toilets. Well, DRI. There was a bunch of Oxnard bands. Um, 
I mean, yeah, it was I, it was blank, it was intense. You got SDB, right? Um, yeah, the the music uh, scene, the the punk rock scene was incredibly intense, and and it was violent. I mean, Los Angeles was the most violent scene in the world, and it was I mean, it was intense and it was intensely violent. A lot of gangs, La Mirada punks, uh, Robert Goodwin from Head Noise used to be a part of LMP. You had you had the L.A. Death Squad in Hollywood. You had the Hollywood punks, L.A. Death Squad. You had FFF, Fight for Freedom in North Hollywood. You had the BPO, Burbank Punk Organization. You had um, the Suicidals uh, Boys in Venice. I mean, it was it was insane. And to suggest that what was coming out of Orange County was punk rock when that's really what was going on at the time, um, is laughable. Um, and, and guess what? None of those bands were playing in L.A. or in Hollywood. They were playing youth groups. And I'm, I'm not, I don't, I'm not going to focus a lot on that because that's not what we're here to talk about. But that's why we did what we did. That's why we started what we started and why we did it the way we did it. And there was, outside of Orange County, in the or, outside of the Orange County Calvary Chapel network of youth groups, there was no place to play. There was no Christian punk rock scene. There was nothing. So we were, we were playing parties, secular parties. We were playing a... The we bar. did a, we did a, we did a, yeah, we're playing bars, we're playing clubs. Uh, we played, so here's, here's the one other band that we knew about that existed. So very early on, we, uh, we were introduced to, you know, we met the undercover guys and we were told about Pat, nobody, Joe's younger brother, who had a band called Immortal Youth. That was a punk rock band. <laughs> yep. And so we started playing shows with Pat and we played a, a secular college, um, an outdoor secular college gig, the uh, Valley College. That's yeah. where all those photos are and the newspaper clippings. So it right, was yeah. us and immortal youth. Punks play for God. That was the we made the newspaper and everything. Um, we did a show for Hollywood Press that was really bizarre because Christians had no idea what to do with us. So with so needless yeah, to say, Hollywood Presbyterian was was classic. Right. So we we go in the studio March of 1983. Hook up with uh, um, with Joe uh, um, Little uh, Pat Taylor, with Immortal Youth, and we did that. We did we did that show with him in May at the at the, at the, the university was in May, July, and by by fall we had to pull the plug. We had to stop what we were doing because the Christians were like they were coming at us because there was no way you could be a Christian and play the music that we were playing. So we have a two song demo. Let's 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 get let's get to some questions real quick before we int we we go to the how we met up with Terry Taylor thing. Oh, other bass influences, which I totally forgot, which I should have mentioned. Colin Molding from XTC. If you've never listened to them, you need to. Yeah. Uh, how was our experience working with Terry Taylor? I'll tell you in a minute. Did you ever play with with King's X? Nope. Nope. Um did the, the music from the, 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 the songs we did, I did with the band with Don Bowles, they never got released. Uh, who came up with the name Scatter Few? So we used to hang out at Bob. So we would, Bob's Big Boy. That guy, that guy right there. That guy on my screen. I'm, I'm over here. <laughs> I, I'm trying to point, but it's like. <laughs> oh, I know, right? So we, were at, we used to go to Bob's Big Boy, I guess after rehearsal or after Bible oh, yeah, study or yeah. something. And I'm and literally... Louis was always fasting and wouldn't eat until midnight. Oh, I know, right? And I'm literally... We're literally um, walking from the car to the Bob's Big Boy. If you don't know, it's, a, it's an L.A. thing. It started in Toluca Lake, actually, which is right next door to Burbank. But, and I, I, as I was walking across the parking lot, I remember it being rainy. And I think I was with Steve. Oh. All right, move on. <laughs> and I said, and I looked at him and I said, and I said, smite the shepherd and the sheep shall be scattered. That's, that's a Bible verse, if you didn't know. Uh, and then I looked at him and I went, we're the scattered few. And I'm like, holy crap, there it is. It, it, I have said this for 40 years. Scattered few was always bigger than us. Scattered few was always bigger than us. It, it was its own living organism. We were just trying to manage it and play catch up. That's how that happened. Uh, whatever happened to Perrin? You're, you're, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming you're asking about Alan Pellerin. Pellerin. Whatever happened to Pellerin, Alan, uh, Omar? 
Uh, as far as I know, he's married, and I don't know what he's doing for a living, but he's, as far as I know, he's alive and doing well. I, I haven't spoken to him in years. Last time I communicated with him was through Facebook, but I haven't, I haven't talked to him in a long time. Um, pretty sure he's on Facebook still. Hey, Al. <laughs> Hold on, I'm just I'm trying to delete. Uh, there's people just hijacking us. Let's see. What a trip. All right, what else? Um, where did the name Rommel Domkus come from? I used to go by the name Alan Rommel. My, I have a middle initial of R. This is old news. I had a middle initial of R. I took my dad's, my stepdad, Lithuanian's dad's name, put it to the R, Rommel. Uh, when I got back to this, when we started Scattered Few, the singer was named Alan. I didn't want two Alans, like... Devo. So I went with Rommel. Bob wanted Bob too. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, Alan didn't write any songs. Oh, Tell are her. you seeing this? How do you? How are you seeing this? Question? Yeah. Because I opened the window that says comments. Oh, 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 okay. You're looking at those. I'm looking at something else. Did Jane's Addiction copy our style? I wouldn't say that. I don't think so. No. We were contemporaries. We were, the, we were doing it at the same time. Yeah. Uh, Alan, where are you originally from? I am from Los Angeles. I was born in Pasadena, California. Uh, are you and Omar fool or half brothers? He's my mother's son. We are full oh, brothers. Hey. Oh, my gosh. La raza. No. Uh, how did we meet Alan Pellerin? He, he went to school with Omar. They went to school together. They Alan went to church I together. High school friends. And I told him was into punk rock and i told him yeah it's really great you go to a show you beat up on people and slam pit and your right. mom says you have a good time and you're like yeah and basically talk to alan about you know salvation not, not me faith. pellerin pellerin yeah yeah what else okay so we're in 1983 um we have a two song wait, wait, we didn't answer how long alan alan pellerin was in the band Go ahead. Um, just, just in the, the 83, 84 era, just basically what you hear on um, Out of the Attic, that's, those are the years that Alan Pellerin was in the band. Yeah. Okay, so in 1983, we have a two-song demo, and I had told myself when I was in, so we got, 1981, remember I told you I came back to the States, I have the, uh, I have Alarma, and I have um, horrendous disc. So everything I knew to be true about Daniel Amos from Shotgun Angel was now manifested in my hands with those two albums. OMG. This is legit rock. And, you know, going where they went with the horrendous disc, which was mind-blowing for the time, because that was made in 1977. And then here you have a legitimate New Wave album in 1981 called Alarma. I'm like, oh my gosh, if I ever get back to the U.S., and if I ever do music again, those, this is what I remember telling, I looked, I looked uh, my cousin in the eye and I said, if I ever go back, if I ever get back to the States and if I ever do music again, I want Cherry Taylor to produce it. So, I'm, I'm back in the U.S.S.A. <laughs> I'm back in, I almost said, I'm back in Biden's America with a K, but we have a lot of liberals here, so I won't say that. So, I'm back in the U.S.A., and I have a two-song demo, and I pull out the Daniel Amos album, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to find Terry Taylor, and I'm going to have him produce me. So I'm watching the numbers, because I'm, I'm expecting so a whole bunch of people kids? to leave all of a, uh, all of a sudden. There, What's there's that? no internet. No internet. No there's cell no phones, no internet. I'm looking at the back of an album, and it says uh, Street Level Agency. Oh, cool, baby. Street Level Artist, or something like that, with a phone number. So I, I make the phone call. And I leave a voicemail. And I, so, right? So I'm doing this, right? I'm connecting dots. I'm, I make a phone call. They give me a number to, and I make a phone call, and I make a phone. I'm doing this phone call, leave a message, get a call back, right? I'm doing this, this insanity thing. And then I finally get a hold. So then I get Ed McTaggart. I'm going to be able to talk to Ed McTaggart, the drummer for Daniel Amos. <laughs> I'm not sure what label he was working for, but I get a hold. So I'm on the phone with Ed McTaggart, and I'm like, hi, Ed. I, I introduce myself, 
And he remembered my letters, are mine and Eric letters from Guatemala. And, um, and I'm like, look, I'm looking for Terry Taylor, da, 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 da. And that's what happened. So he, he goes, well, I will, I'll give me your number. I'll tell Terry everything you just told me. And, and that's, I'm like, all right, thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, you know, and, if, and if Terry's interested, he'll call you back. It was one of those things. Because, I mean, you know, that's, that's what it is. And I'll never forget. We're have, we're, I'm, so Omar is 17. So he's at home and he's going to school. He's, he's still in high school. I'm 19. I'm fresh off the boat. I'm squatting at my parents' house. We're sitting around the table having dinner. And, um, and the phone rings. And my mom answers it. She goes, one moment, please. And she covers up the phone and she looks at me and she goes, Terry Taylor? And my insides went, oh, here we go. I hadn't, I hadn't said a single thing to Omar. Omar had no idea what I was doing while he was at school. He had no <clears throat> idea that I was trying to get Terry Taylor on the line. So Omar's like, blows his mind. He's like, what? And I'm like, I get on the phone. Hey, what's up, bro? You know, playing it all cool. <laughs> And so we meet, we, he's going to be in the valley recording, he's producing somebody in the valley, some, I, I'm not sure who it was. I don't remember. It would be interesting to know who it was. Who was he producing in the, Michael Pyatt, who was Terry Taylor producing in the San Fernando Valley, like Van Nuys, in 1983? I, I'd like to know who that was. So he's, um, so, we're, so I'm going to meet up with Terry in the valley at the studio, and I'm gonna, and he he wrote he writes about this little meeting in the liner notes of the original Syndices. And I'm gonna slip him this two song cassette. And I do. First of all, there's Terry Taylor, and I'm trying to be all cool about it. What's up, bro? Right? What did I look like? I don't know what I looked like back then. But, oh! <laughs> wow. That's kidding, man. Um, I probably had blue black hair. It was before I got a mohawk. But anyway. Um, I, I obviously looked the part, and um, I'm I'm slipping him a cassette, and it was like it was like three minutes. Bam! He put the cassette in his in his trench coat. Remember that trench coat he used to wear? He put that the cassette. He might have had leopard hair. I think maybe I don't know. He puts it in his. Oh man, that was an amazing haircut. But he that puts picture it. Picture was from that meeting. He right? puts it in his. He puts yeah no, no he puts it in his jacket, and that's it. We go, I mean, so we're working, we're trying to get gigs. We meet, there was a question here about Pat Nobody. We met Pat Nobody because he was brothers with Joey. We had met Ojo, and then he introduced us to Pat. So we met Pat through music because Pat lives an hour and a half south of us. He's in Orange County. We're in, we're in L.A. We're in Burbank. We're in Hollywood. Okay. So now we're waiting for, now, now I'm waiting for Terry Taylor to get back to me. So in the meantime... We're playing gigs, we're playing some secular shows, we're playing parties, we're doing everything that we can to, to we're, we're, the hustle, the hustle. All right, do we have any other questions here? Um, uh, did not meet Larry Norman. Nope. Larry I've never Norman. met Larry Norman, no. We, uh, we were the first to say that you were Christians in a band and not a Christian band. Uh, that argument is still going today. Any thoughts? That, yeah, I have, well, I have very strong thoughts about that. Christianity isn't something I do. It's what I am. My faith in Messiah is who I am. It's not like an accessory. It's not something I put on and take off like a tie or whatever. So, I always hated that because it was ugh. like, if you're a plumber. Yeah, the Christian plumber are you a nonsense. Christian plumber? Are you a Christian gas attendant? Christian mechanic? Christian air conditioning guy, uh, Christian chef. Yeah, I don't, I don't think so. It's only musicians that get railed with that crap. Hate it. Yeah, it was. It's not. It's sad. Not much has changed in forty years. No, not at all. It's kind of scary. Um, mom, 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 mom. So, Terry gets back with us. I'd love to work with you. Woohoo! Then we do this. We do this. Terry wants to work with us. Yep. And um, so we decide. So, what we're going to do is we're going to go into the recording studio with Terry for two days and knock out 11 songs at Wyfield Studios in Orange County. This is like the recording studio mecca for Christian rock. You got to remember, Christian rock started in Orange County, not Nashville. 
It Maranatha. moved to Nashville. Yeah. So we're at Whitefield Studio. This is like the mecca of Christian music recording studios. And we're going to go in there with Terry Taylor as producer and Tom Roy as engineer. And we do not look... Well, let me put it this way. <laughs> wow. Don't, don't forget, we were going to have to drive hours to get there. So Ed yeah, about an hour and a half. Out of, his, out of his love for us, who got us a camper trailer to sleep in. Who? But we didn't. Uh, Ed McTaggart. Oh, I don't remember that stuff. Yeah, we didn't. But well, we didn't sleep in the camper van. We ended up driving back. Oh. Which, which was fine. He didn't mind. But it was, you know, still, I think it was super sweet of him to do that. Right. And so the lineup is Alan Pellerin. Uh, Brian Anderson on drums. He's the guy in the picture with us with Terry. So Terry, so here's the first thing that does. Terry shows up at our church for three days to do pre-production, to listen to our songs, and, with, and he helped us decide what songs we're going to go into the studio and do. We worked on some arrangements. I think he sat there like this. <laughs> worked on some arrangements. Dude, his briefcase, remember his bag? He walked around with a he walked around with a brown paper bag as a briefcase. Remember, even Sam West would talk to Mac about his briefcase. How many years later? Eight years later or something crazy like that. Seven years later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, it was hilarious. But he was taking notes. We're determining what songs we're going to do. Oh, pre-production. And then we went to the studio in Orange County, and we recorded 11 songs. And you'll find five or six of them on the uh, Out of the Attic. Now... Here's the fun part. The reason why it never saw the light of day is oh my because gosh. while we were recording, oh my gosh, there were some Maranatha and there was there was uh, about four different label reps there. I don't even remember the labels, but they were they were there, and they were listening to what we were doing and kind of weirded out by what they were hearing, and they didn't understand because you know they started telling us, oh well. And they mentioned the bands that we had spoke of earlier, which I'm not going to list now. That it, Christian rock would never get harder than those bands. Those, yeah. yeah. So Alan had a fanzine. I don't remember the name of it. Uh, it was it was a it was a maximum rock and roll. Okay. And there was there was a band in there, and so I'm going to use foul language, and sorry if it offends anyone. But don't, you don't have to say it. It was called the Crusa F. Crusa F. Yes. Okay. It was their, a punk symbol, rock band. their their logo was a crucifix made of erect penises that were ejaculating. With Jesus on. With, with an impaled Messiah on there yeah. with a heart on, ejaculating. And yeah. we we showed them their ad and we told them this this is what is what they're doing to your Messiah. This is our competition. This the is bands our the bands you champion here in against. Yeah, the the, we the bands them, we said, the bands that you're talking about they're not going to reach these people. No. We are. and they turned around and left. Yep, Never they didn't like again. that. They don't like it that when we do that today. It's been 40 years; nothing's changed. That literally happened. But what what did Terry Taylor tell us? The first thing he told us when we first arrived at the studio. I don't remember. He goes, "These people don't like me. They're not going to like you because you're with me." <laughs> <laughs> he flat out told me that. He told us that. Because here's the thing. Daniel Amos in the 70s decided they didn't want to be a Christian band. They wanted to be a real band. Bad, and that yeah. got them ostracized. That, that, that turned the tables on them. They got blackballed because they wanted to be a real band. And then they signed to Larry Norman, who was the bad boy, and this and that and the other. So he basically told us, because you're in the studio with me, and I'm, you know, and I'm producing this, we're, we're guilty by association. It doesn't help that we have piercings, uh, we look the way we look. And see, here's the difference between here's here's what here's but here's what my problem has been my whole life. I don't put these clothes on on the weekend. <laughs> you know, this is the way I've looked. This is what this is how I looked like 24-7. And they, that's a hard thing for them to swallow. I, I've had those challenges even with Spyglass Blue in the 90s. So they, they, they weren't going to, they were, going, they were not going to let us get any further than where we were at in the studio with Terry. No one was going to sign it. 
We could have maybe done it independently, but anyway, everything from then on, it started to, it, we had to, it started tanking. We had to, we had to kind of like take a step back. Um, you also have to understand, I think age has a lot to do with it. We have Omar 17, Alan Pellerin's 18, Brian and I are 19. We're like young kids, man. And we've got an entire industry coming at us. We have an entire movement. We, we Christianity is like not, they're not in our, remember when we would show up? So they, there used to be Christ, Christian nights like at Disneyland and Knott's Berry Farm and Magic Mountain and stuff. All over, all over Southern California, and we would go to those things, man. And the in 1983, the Christian jock, those jock, Christian jock guys, all you know, all those they would want to hurt us. They would want to beat us up in like in the name of Jesus. I kick your ass in Jesus' name. I mean, it's like, what are you doing? You know, what if we weren't Christians and you're doing this to us, and we know that you're all Christians. You're in a bus that says whatever the hell your church name is, Church of God is on on the bus, and you're like cussing at us and throwing crap at us and stuff. We're like, wow. And I'm 19 and I'm kind of leading this charge and it's like, yeah, it's a I bit freaking much. Of that. I'd love to share. So oh, please. we're at one of those magic mountain nights or something. We're passing some church bus and the, and the youth group is sticking their heads out, yelling at us, get saved. You need to repent, you know, blah, blah, blah. And Pellerin stands there and looks at oh, them. Man, and goes, I remember I'm a Christian. Yeah. They just were freaking out and yelling at him and stuff. So Pellerin loses his mind and starts looking at them and he goes, Pharisees! And he just starts screaming at them. It was unbelievably cool. I oh, wish I had man. it on film. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> it was nuts, man. It was just a uh, few times. You know, we were the we uh, were it was Let me answer this one. Yes, Michael, David. Uh we did meet Jerry Chamberlain and other DA members. Oh yeah. So and, uh, Jerry was a wonderful, wonderful uh, player and a really absolutely. He was so supportive of me as a musician, as a bass player. Are you ta okay? You're not ta was, Jerry Chamberlain's a guitarist. You're talking oh, I'm about? Sorry. Uh, no, uh, yeah, I'm sorry. I gaffed there. Yeah, uh, but yeah, Jerry. Uh, last time I saw Da, they were um, in Phoenix. It was on their last tour, and uh, I just loved watching Jerry doing yeah. that on the Moon by himself on guitar. You well, can find it on YouTube. Do you, so while we were in. The studio. Met Tim. While we were in the studio, yeah, you met Tim. While we were in the studio making the eleven songs, and it was June of nineteen eighty-three. I've been back stateside for five months, and I'm in the studio with Terry Taylor. I'm like, that's too fast. See, like I said, it's always been bigger than us. But do you remember what Terry Taylor showed us and asked us our opinion about? Did you, what? Yeah, I'm talking to you. <laughs> no, I, I didn't even catch it. I was reading a question. While we're in the studio, June of 1983, making the 11 songs with Brian yeah. and Alan Pellerin, do you remember what Terry Taylor pulled out of his briefcase bag and showed, to, showed us and asked us our opinion? Uh, um, There's no way you can, No. The cover art for Dot Bullganger. Doppelganger, yeah. So he pulled out the four different versions that. of the cover that they were considering. With the, the, yeah, with uh, the blinds. Right. So he showed us what they were looking. There was like four, three or four ideas. And, they, and he asked, which, ones, which one do you like? And I'm not saying it's because of the one we picked, but that's the one that's the cover <laughs> of Doppelganger. I'm, I'm just saying. I'm just, I'm just saying. saying. I can say that because I was freaking there. But anyway, so we do this, and, and so we go on a hiatus. Now, mind you, I had already started, my, my life was already, uh, yeah, it was no bueno. I was having some issues. And, um, and so we, 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 took, we, we took all of 84 off. I went, went to that ranch thing where I met that, Jess, you know, that Jesse Gift reference in, uh, later. Uh, I didn't steal anything. Yeah, that's where that happened. And then uh, in '85, we have well, we had we had a stint with Andy Zakari on guitar, and I went on drums. That was a freaking amazing lineup, with me on drums and and Andy on guitar and you on bass. That power trio that, that there guy, was in that guy, that guy was played. nuts. That guy was so good. That guy and you'll hear it. It's, you'll see it on so Out of the Attic. Good. There's a tidbit of a 
me of me on the drums going from Wild Reprobate. That's Andy on guitar. That's me on drums. And oh, as man. it's fading out, you hear him doing these little solo things. Oh. You're, you're going <laughs> freaking amazing stuff. Oh, man. Uh, what else? Um, and so in 84, we, we try to... No, in 85, we try and, we try and give it some new life. Uh, with again with Pellerin and you and I, but we have Ben Eschbach on guitar. Uh, some of you might know the name Ben, ben Eschbach. He 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 went off and did uh, the Sugar Plastic, which became bigger than anything I've ever done, and uh, was working with like or hanging out with Rick Ocasek and yeah, Ben and I still talk. Um, yeah, it's it's yeah, Ben Eschbach was on guitar. That brother. didn't work out very well. We have some recordings of it. What's that? Uh, no, I was just saying my brother yeah. about Ben. Yeah. And uh, so we had to pull the plug and call it quits. And then I started, I started Signe in 1986. And so I decided, based on what had just happened to me for the last two plus years, that I would bypass the Christian music scene at, entirely. I was totally going to bypass the Christian music scene. And I was going to go straight to the secular market. And that's where I did Signe, 1986 through 1989, four years we're talking press, K-Rock. We played three or four nights a month. I mean, it was, we worked that thing, man. We hustled that more than I can even tell you. Um, learned everything I needed to know about the music industry. I mean, we went for it. It was 100% secular. We didn't do any Christian anything. Uh, how many times, I think we had two different meetings with um, oh, man, uh, the Black Flag, Greg and Chuck for their label that HR was on. Oh, SST. SST Records. I think I had two different meetings with them. I mean, we were like, it was it was man, it was intense, intense hustle. Uh, re record stations, uh, re recording studios, radio stations, the industry playing our brains out. So we met up with, a, we, I met HR, I, I met him personally in 87. I had been a fan since Eric had first turned me on to them, uh, the summer of 1983. And uh, we saw the, the Eye Against Eye tour. It was a year after the Eye Against Eye tour. HR was on a speaking tour, preaching Rastafarianism. And I guess I wowed him with my knowledge of the scripture. And we became very close friends. Uh, he worked with Signier. Signier played the SST party in San Pedro that year. We played it as Signier, and then we played it as Scattered Few. Uh, we played that party twice. That party was the first time, the first one, was the first time I ever jammed with Earl. That was yeah. cool. <laughs> because cool HR, stuff for young so guy. Signier opened up for Human Rights, and that's where we met David Byers. Yes, it is. Kenny and then Dredd Scattered Few opened up for guy. human rights at that party, and then we went on tour. Yeah. yeah. Um, what else? So when we were in Signe, we, 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 we played a lot of shows for K-Rock. K-Rock, we were on that radio show a lot. Local music. Yeah, we were getting a lot of airplay. I mean, it was like, man, it was, talk about momentum. Um, Omar, share, share one of your uh, experiences at, the, at, the, at a K-Rock local music show that you had. One of, one of my brushes with greatness. Yeah, yeah, your, your brush with greatness, your, your David Letterman brush with greatness. We were, um, we were playing a club called the Palomino, which was in North Hollywood. It was a country bar. And they always had, uh, they, uh, I think it was once a month, they had the local music show that K-Rock sponsored. And so we had a slot on that night. We played, we did our set. And then where the stage is, right behind the stage is the doors that open into the parking lot. So the band could unload and then the next band could load up onto the stage and perform. So we un we're unloading the stage. And my friend, Greg Chang, comes up to me and goes, hey, Omar, Omar. Or no, no, somebody, somebody came up to me and said that uh, Jerry Lee Lewis was at the bar. And so I look at the bar, there's, there's nobody there that looks like Jerry Lee Lewis. I'm like, whatever. So we unload our equipment. We're in the parking lot loading up our cars. And my friend Greg comes up to me, goes, hey, Omar, see that car over there? I said, yeah. He said, Jerry Lee Lewis is in there. He wants to talk to you. Greg kind of functioned as a manager every once in a while, yeah. And I was like, what? So I go over to the car and I go to the driver's side. 
And the guy who's sitting behind the driver's seat is not Jerry Lee Lewis. And I'm like, you wanted to talk to me? And he and the driver looks at me and goes, no, he does. And he points to the passenger side. And I lean my head over and I look. And it's Jerry Lee Lewis, the man himself, the killer, right? And he, and this is not me stroking my ego. This is him complimenting me. I'm 21 at the time. So imagine how big my head was after that. He looked at me and he said, son, that's some of the finest bass playing I've seen in a long time. Keep yeah. it up. That really happened. I never forgot those words, man. That is like so sweet. So sweet. So that was my brush with greatness with Jerry Lee Lewis. Yes. Back in those days, you know, those, those, uh, yeah. those fun memories uh, of that. That, so. that completely really happened. Yeah. yeah. All right. So we're being You're asked. Uh, okay. How do we meet the front man of Circle One? Okay. So while we were doing the, the, the ministry, the street ministry on Hollywood Boulevard in 1983, it's when we started doing that. Um, we met a guy named Richard who, whose parents owned a wig factory. Uh, I guess it had been a, it, it was a retired wig factory. So this guy was having Bible studies in the wig factory. And I guess John Macias, for the singer for Circle One, got saved through Richard. And so John was at these Bible studies all the time. Well, when we met with them, we now had a place where we could bring food. We could bring toiletries, blankets, socks things of that nature, for the homeless punk rock youth of Hollywood. Now we had a place where we could store it, leave it, distribute it. And they were having regular Bible studies, so we started showing up to them, and John from Circle One was there. And so we got to talking, obviously, about his band and our band. And we didn't play together, but we, we did go to the shows, and we would be on the list and all the guest list and all that. So, that, so, we, had be, so we became friends. That, that's, that's what happened there with John Macias. What else? Any more questions? Uh, uh, let's see. The Metal Priest, um, one of the few fretless bass players that I've ever known of. Actually, I can't name another. How do you think your style and use of a fretless bass has helped to set Scatter Few apart? Um, well, you know, back when... So playing fretless in that kind of music wasn't something that somebody else was doing. The only other person maybe at that time that was doing it was um, Les Claypool from Primus, but they, they weren't, I don't know what they were doing in 90. I know I was praying, playing my four string, doing what I was doing. And a lot of it was to, to make people look and go, oh, he's doing that on fretless. You know, he's playing fast punk rock music on fretless. He's slapping on fretless. Um, it was to impress people, but at the same time, I also thought playing fretless was just awesome. So that that's why, um, and I think it helps set scatter few apart because it's not a, it's not a fretted bass player playing with a pick, shadowing all the guitar riffs that are played by the guitarist. Yeah. There are some times where I am shadowing what the guitar plays, but for the most part, I'm in my own universe in the soundscape that is bass in a song, and I'm playing something that's not at all what the guitarist is doing. It's yeah. completely own separate voice. We, that's how I think it stands out. Yeah, there's no way. I mean, why would you do that? <laughs> um, I mean, most of the music that you listen to, the bass guitar is playing what the guitarist is playing. That makes absolutely never made sense to me. The, we only do that or I only do that. But it's not something that you, you should be doing as a writer. That bass guitar has got to be a standalone. <laughs> no, we never recorded Fool's Gold. No, well, we, we played it with played HR. It live. Man, we, we did a man, we did a bunch of shows with HR as as as, as his uh, as his band. That was uh I was supposed to see him on the 28th here. Um, I haven't seen him and since 2013. I was supposed to see him in San Antonio, but they canceled the show because he was sick. Right. And they moved it to April. So I'll be seeing him in April. So Mike, so did, did, Scatter, did Synthesis get a lot of secular airplay? Um, I think it did to an extent, because that's why we got all that those secular shows up in the Northwest. Uh, so one thing, you, so for example, a friend of ours was living in the Northwest and he saw like posters of sin disease at a secular record store and there was all this movement there. And so I 
guerrilla war, you know, guerrilla marketing did, you know, what I did based on that info, on that intel. And we were able to get all those secular shows that we did up in the Northwest, which people say has started that, all, that, that started the scene up there. That's what they say. I didn't say that, but. Um, okay, all right. a couple questions to me. Uh, what? There's Omar, favorite base brands and models. Um, I don't know. I'm, obviously, I play a Carvin LB70 fretless from that was made in 1988. That's my primary instrument. I have a Hadeen U bass that's fretless. I have a Dean uh, fretless uh, acoustic electric bass, and I have a uh, fretted Fender Jazz Squire that was given to me as a gift, which I really appreciate. Um, but I don't. I don't necessarily think that there's any. Hey man, if it's a good instrument and it ends up being mine, then of course I'm going to play it. I have an upright as well. Hold on. There she is. Wait, wait. I don't know how to work a camera. Sorry. She's right there. Anyway, um, so there's that. Um, and then when I was playing live, I played through these two 18-inch speakers that were PA speakers through a PV uh, CS400 power amp into a Yamaha PV1 preamp. That was my rig. Um, and I don't want to answer the other question or the question after that. <laughs> I don't know which ones you're talking about. Um, no, I don't. I'll just leave it at that. Well, I, I don't know I'm what you're sure, talking about. You're being all I'm cryptic sure, now. I'm sure Michael, I'm sure Michael Pyatt will, will understand what I'm answering. Uh, oh, about May, Omega number five. It's beyond his ability to comprehend. That's what's going on there. What's going on with Ministries Walking? Um, I'm trying to mix a song that we did a long time ago. Uh, I do intend on having us do a new recording. I'm, I've, I'm just a little busy. Uh, were we influenced by, by bad brains at all? Yes. Uh, we're in the Northwest. Yes. Portland. You know, Portland and above. Seattle, Tacoma, and Portland were huge markets for us. So, what else? Okay, so 1989. Woo -hoo. So, we're, we're doing this band called Signier. I break that up. Frustration, right? Oh, man. And um, so, we, we, we did Tiananmen. We, record, we wrote, and wrote, wrote and recorded Tiananmen Square. Uh, we we the band Scream from DC. David Grohl, Dave Grohl was in the band. We brought they came home to our house after the show, and they stayed at our house for like a week. After two days, I think a singer, yeah, at that time I believe so. The singer and Dave I think went back to Hollywood, and then and then since we weren't going to do, we didn't know what we were going to do now. And then I had this vision of us playing Cornerstone Festival next summer, and I went, holy crap. Let's, we need to start Scattered For You up again. We need to ditch the drummer, take the guitarist, Paul, you, and me, and Drew, our brother, on keyboards, basically four-fifths of Signier, and we need to replace the drummer and do this and start and do Scattered For You again. And all right, it's been seven years, six years. Mm. It's 1989. It's been six years. There's a possibility that Christianity has grown, has grown up just a little bit. Just there's, enough there's for us to maybe that, do something. There's another what? factor in that, though. See, we stopped doing Signier, and a friend of mine, yours too, but, I mean, he was, he was a guy I had known for years by the name of Drew Fisher, was running sound for a bunch of the long hair metal bands in the late 80s within yeah. Christian music, Baron Cross, uh, Tourniquet, and all those other guys. And he would go cross country and he had a small scatter few sticker on his uh, anvil briefcase and people would just freak out about the sticker and he would had told us those last whatever seven years you guys need to do scatter few you guys need to do scatter yeah few. that's absolutely true following blah 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 and we told him dude it's never going to happen and so after that whole signier episode he saw us again and he was like you guys need to do scatter few you have a following 
And so that's when Alan and I were like, well, I don't know. Let's talk about it. Alan's like, I'll reach out to Terry, see what he thinks, you know? And so rather, yeah, Drew Fisher literally, Drew Fisher literally played what would become the Out of the Attic release. He literally played that all over the world for like five, six years. Literally all over the world. And people would go, oh my gosh, you know, what's going on? What, what is this? And he would tell them it's, it's got a few. I thought that was, you know, it was like, it was like mermaids. It's a myth. They don't really exist. <laughs> He's like, yeah, here it is. And, the, and, you know, the, it wasn't available. You couldn't buy it. It, was, it didn't exist. And so, um, so in 1989, we, we got rid of our Signier drummer. Unicorn. We kept, we, kept the drum, we kept the guitarist. We kept you. We kept me. We kept our brother on keyboards, Drew. And we had to go find a new drummer. And so in L.A., there's a thing called the Recycler, and they have a whole music section. It's, been, we, it's an institution. We've been doing, using the Recycler for a gazillion years. And we put an ad out for a punk funk reggae drummer and the the only person that uh, that answered the ad that we even thought was going to even remotely have a chance at, at getting our thumbs up was this was this guy named sam everybody else was just like yeah no that ain't gonna happen and um and so we auditioned sam and we he had learned some of the material and uh we got him we gave him the job um we so now so now we so now so by this time omar and i have we decided okay what old songs are we going to rework that and, was really fun by the way yeah what, trying to like like recreating what we're going to do and how we're going to do it that was a lot of fun yeah I enjoyed that a lot. So what what songs are we going to rework and what songs are we going and and, and then we, you know of course and we've got to do new material. And um, so that's what we did. And so by the time Sam got in, we had stuff for him to learn, we had old stuff for him to learn, and we had new stuff to uh, to figure out. And that's what we did. And we started playing shows. Okay, so 1983, March 83, you have Scattered Few and you have Immortal Youth. Those are like the only two Christian punk bands that exist. Not even up for debate. By, by, the, by August of 1983, and I just found this out a couple weeks ago, Julio Rey had a band called The Visitors. And they put out a they put out an, a, a single in August of '83, and it's really good. It's called something about a gang gang gunslinger. Um, it's on, on it's on uh, Bandcamp. The Visitors, Julio Reyes, in it's his band. And then by 1984, they did the lead, and we used to talk to the lead because we you know there's nobody to talk to, and. Um, so the so Julio Ray came out with something in eighty in the, at the end of eighty three, then in eight ninety eighty four the lead, and then by eighty five eighty six you got Burrito, um, doing all sorts of stuff with AOTC. Um, I mean, he did like two or three different types of bands by eighty five eighty six with Dennis Rudolph. He was involved with some of them, and then the Crucified. They had the Crucified actually had a recording out by nineteen eighty five. And 1985 is the year that One Bad Pig formed. That's as far as I'll go, because that's just, that's just ridiculous. So you have the Crucified with music out in 85. Um, Pat, nobody, didn't come out with Call It Whatever You Want until 1989. So we start, so now, in, so it's, now it's 1989. We've got all this... In, experience under our belts we start going to christian punk shows <laughs> and we're we're freaking out because 
there was you could never go to a Christian punk show because one, there's no bands and there's no venues, and churches aren't going to let you play at their venues. And all of a sudden, there's this whole scene. And remember, one of the first shows we went to, it was the Crucified played and Pat nobody, and we walked up to up, up to Pat while he was setting up, and we were talking smack, and he kind of ignored us, and then he looked up and he saw who it was, and he was like, "Oh my God, are you guys back?" He <laughs> weird. He wigged out. He goes, "Oh my God, are you guys back?" And I'm like, "Yeah, we're gonna we're back." He goes, "Oh good, because we need you," and 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 we we I mean we like literally I think Sam joined the band and we were gigging like within weeks. I mean it was like that fast. It was fast. And, and Sam was the one who brought in Ed. Right. So oh, that's oh, it was all his. So he brought this guitarist because Paul was like, "I don't want to be in the band. I want to go to a college for a year." I'm like because Paul's like the guy. And so we went, okay. And then he brought in Ed Lover. We called him Ed Lover. Um, I don't even know what his real name is or nothing. But So he started playing shows. So now he's on guitar. We're doing shows. And we, we I remember, where did we showcase? Oh, my gosh. Was it the TBN, Matt Crouch, The Sun, his Friday night trying to be hip show? event that we played at and terry showed up because now because right because now once once we had some not once we had new revamped material and new material and the band was solid and we could play like i called up terry and said you need to come to check this out we need we need we need for you to we need we need a deal and you're producing it so he came out and watched us real videos that's right and then, so he came out and saw us. <laughs> yeah. So he came out and saw us at a Matt Crouch Real Videos event somewhere in Orange County. I think it was at, uh, what do we call it? It's church. Uh, what was that guy's name? It was like, um, it was a gang, Mario like a, like an ex-gangster lowrider. Mario Murillo. No, no, not Mar- It was like a Valley. Anyway, I don't remember. But anyway. And he, Terry saw us and he goes, you sure you want to do this thing? I'm like, I'm sure I want to do this thing. And he goes, okay. And so he sold us to Frontline because he was a house producer at Frontline. Now, we had been talking, I, I had been negotiating a deal with a label called Narrow Path. And we got a deal with Narrow Path. And we made a demo before we got Sam and before we got Ed. You, me, and those other two guys. And we made a demo and I don't know. We don't. It doesn't exist. But, the, the, but, but with the drummer, I don't remember Tool. his name. Tool was, was the Tula. guitarist. Ryan Tula. So we had him on guitar and the other guy on cool. drums. So it was you, yeah. me, and these two guys. And we did a demo of like Beggar and Wall Reprobate. And it was like it was the, the best. Track at Mark's oh, my gosh. It was the greatest sounding thing I think we've ever no, done. Exists. Couldn't tell you where it is. The versions of of Beggar, Wall Reprobate was a little what, slower. What Chang has it. It was I don't know. It was it was a lot more. There was a lot more groove to it because uh, it was a, it was amazing. But those and they but they they didn't they didn't want to do it so they left and that's why we got Sam and Ed. So he made so Terry goes, "Are you sure you want to do this thing?" I go, "Yeah, we want to do this thing." So. So he went to front. So we were making a deal because we made those demos for Narrow Path. So we had we had already kind of like uh, we had a verbal with Narrow Path, but no paper. And then Terry went to Frontline and told them this is this is what his his exact words were. Scatterfew is back. I just saw them. We have to sign them. They're the new undercover. And he looks at me and he goes, "I have to tell him that not to insult you, but because that's how I'm going to sell it." And it'll and, and and it'll sell. And I'm like, do what you have to do, and that's what he did. And Frontline bought bought the deal. They bought it. So here's the thing. Here's the thing. And when I say it's so much, it's always been bigger than us. Here's what people don't understand that you need to understand. We went. We said we we shut the door on Signe, fired the drummer, like October. Got a new drummer. Reworked music, wrote new music, started playing gigs, got son, uh, got Terry involved, got a deal, and then went into the studio by February and played Cornerstone that summer of 1990, 10 months. 
From the decision to do Scattered Few again to, to Cornerstone Festival with an album on Frontline Records, 10 months. Freaking, if you're in a band, you know that's not possible. All you, all you band people out there are going, no freaking way. Yeah, Yahweh. That's exactly how that freaking happened, man. It's insane, but that's how it happened. I told well, you, I saw, us, I, I saw us at Cornerstone the next summer, and sure enough, we were there. With a, so we played a show, the show with the, with, the, with the magical, famous Black Power t-shirt show with the Crucified. And we announced from stage that we had signed to Frontline Records. And Mark Solomon says his heart fell out of his chest. His, 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 whatever, what's the, what's the proper saying there, the colloquialism there? Because they had heard that we had signed to Narrow Path, so they signed to Narrow Path. <laughs> and here we are announcing, no, we're not going with Narrow Path. We just signed a deal with Frontline. And they're like, and everyone freaked out because Frontline Records was a major in that scene. It wasn't an independent like Narrow Path. It was a major label in Christian rock. What do I know? Uh, I, I, I've been trying to get a secular deal for the last six years or whatever it had been, four years. Man. Fun times. All right. We, we recorded that album. How long were you on Frontline? Uh, a year? Maybe. So here's what happened. Sin Disease comes out. <coughs> People are freaking out about it. Because it doesn't sound like a Christian record. We're talking about gangs, drugs, assassinations. We're talking about real life, and um, we're, we're we're talking about all the modern day preachers that were currently <coughs> in scandals: Swagger, right. Baker, Jones. We're we're, we're we're talking about stuff that's taboo. You got to remember, this was the first thing that ever came out in Christian rock that. It was what it was. I mean, nothing existed. It literally blew open the doors for everything that would happen. Um, and it's, you know, but so the label starts getting all these, all these complaints. So they were, they, they, they basically said, they, the, the, the label, all complaints, phone calls or whatever regarding the music they dealt with that. And then they, they, they sent all the questions regarding whether we were actually people of faith or not to my pastor at the time, who's actually here, I guess. I think I saw his name. So he was fielding all the phone calls regarding whether or not we were a Christian or ban whether or not we were Christians or not. And the label was um, dealing with the whole the music thing. Because, you know, the lyrics, you know, God damn my enemies. Uh, we actually had to, uh, most of my lyric sheets don't have, like, in, you know, commas and crap like that. We had to put a comma there so they would understand. It's actually, I think I'm actually, it's a paraphrase of Psalms. God damn my enemies. They thought, oh, he said God damn. You know, it, it, anyway, it, it, sin disease freaked everybody out. And so, and there's this whole rumor campaign thing that happened with a girl that we knew and her boyfriend, and her boyfriend decided he was going to do the, the manly thing and narc on us, and it was all a lie, what she was telling him. And so she fed him a bunch of lies. He went to the sales, the, the Diamante rep at the Christian bookstore he worked at, and then that just, you know, like wildfire. Right? I mean, because, I mean, of course it's got to be real. Have you heard this? Did you see the picture of these guys on this, on this album cover? This guy doesn't have eyebrows. What the hell's wrong with this guy? You know? And, and it's like, we infiltrated Christian rock. A secular, non-Christian, godless bunch of pagans infiltrated Christian rock. We, we pulled a fast one on them. Was, that's literally what they thought. And so 
Zondervan owned Benson, which was the distributor of Diamante, right? That's the chain of, of events there. So Zondervan ca called it, they pulled it. And from what I understand, all the units sold before anything was actually pulled. But that's a big, uh, that's a big um, career uh, spoiler right there. Radio loved us. The press loved us. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Freaking Christians, man. Get down. Get down there. Yeah. Uh, what stage did we play in 1990? It was, I guess, the underground stage. Not the underground stage, but it was like... It was a, it was a, it was, yeah, it was at Gray's Lake, but we played with uh, the same stage that uh, that other Orange County band, that crazy Orange County band. What's his name? He's a big music producer now in Oregon. Fluffy? Fluffy. I think it was Fluffy. Played the same stage. And we played, uh, yeah, we played that side stage. It was a side stage. And then we came back the next year and headlined on Encore 2 or something. <laughs> um, I like this. Amazing how the Signia influence worked and scattered a few song structures. Would you agree? Um, I'm not sure about that. But here's the thing. Oh, oh, I totally, I'm totally spacing out. Before I forget, we've there's like there's like six people less now than we had two minutes ago. Uh, we have some giveaways. <laughs> we have some giveaways. This is brought to you by my record company, Faceless Gen Recording Company. Uh, and um, retroactive records that have graciously, they have put all these groovy things out. Look at this. Look at this. Vinyl. Vinyl. Eee, look at that. Look at that. And, um, and of course, you, know, you saw the box set and uh, the gold disc edition of Synthesis. So we, through ret retroactive records, we are going to give away, tonight we are giving away three of these. And a sampler, a retroactive record sampler. And in, and if you go to our Bandcamp, can you guys put the link for Bandcamp? Through midnight tonight, 25% off all your orders. I should have told you that like two hours ago. My, my apologies. Um, uh, what's the FGRC25 is the code when you're, uh, when you're checking out. FGRC25. Put that code in there. You'll get 25% off your entire order on Bandcamp. And um, if you can put the links up there, moderators. And, and then, okay, so let's, let's give away one of these with the, uh, let's give away all three of them. Well, let's give one away right now, right? Here's the thing regarding Signe's influence on Scattered Few. There are, on Sin Disease, there are one, two Signe songs on Sin Disease, and there's one Signe song on Jawbone. The first two people to type in what those three songs are will get this. U.S. only. United States only. Sorry, internationals. Okay. Ah, man. How long were we on Frontline? Cover songs? Scatterfew didn't... Live we covered... Tin Machine, Bauhaus. That's it, oh. right? No, that was Tin Machine. Oh, yeah, okay. Signe, we covered Bowie. And T Rex. Bad, bad Brains. Yeah, you we covered Bad good. Brains. Now, I want song titles. What, song, what three Signe song titles are found on those two Scattered Few albums? Uh, what other, there's, so what other questions do we have here? There was a number of criticisms that Scattered Few had, has faced, including Job of an Ass not really being a Christian album. It's, it's titled, where, it's a, it's, a, it's Solomon, that? Job of an Ass. I mean, Samuel, I mean, what's his name? Samson. <laughs> <laughs> let me let me whip out every prophet that with, starts with an S. Um, Samson killed the Philistines with the jawbone of an ass. It is a that is m more of a Christian that album. The lyrics to that album are so prophetic. I can't even begin to tell you. So whoever said that is a dumbass. Um, my use of alcohol in public. 
What use of alcohol in public? I'm over 21, people. I can drink if I want. You know, they had a problem with Jesus eating and drinking, too. He came eating and drinking, and he hangs out with, yeah. What, what, any comments? No. Got to have a good scotch. Where, where are you getting those questions from? The um, YouTube? They're being fed to me by the moderators. Okay, never mind. I read that you and Jimmy Brown would have Bowie sing off comps when you were both in the studio together. True? Any good stories of them? Oh my gosh. So, you obviously didn't see uh, a Scatter Few show in May of 1982 where both Jimmy Brown and Eric Clayton. 92. And what did I say? 82. 1992, May of 1992, where Eric Clayton, Savior Machine, Jimmy Brown from Deliverance, and I do a rendition of Man Who Sold the World. It's, there's video. It's on YouTube somewhere. Um, every time Eric and I get together, we bust out on, we, we, do, we do Bowie songs. Every time Jimmy Brown and I get together, we bust out Bowie songs. Um, we we have yeah we have some really good stories. I'm not gonna say anything. That's not for me to announce. That's 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 not for me to say. But yeah, we have some really good stories. We we go way back. I mean, our first meeting with Savory Machine is probably my funniest story. So I'm the guy that's got the makeup, the no eyebrows, the whole Bowie thing. That's um, that's my shtick. I own the cor I I have the corner on that market. We were doing a uh, big three-day Christian rock event in Southern California back in 91. And a bunch of people came running up. Hey, Alan, there, there's some guys trying to get in. They're at the front. Uh, and they're totally ripping off your entire, they're ripping off your stick. And I'm like, what? So we go out to the front to, to see who these guys are. And there's this, there's this whole band all doing the whole doom and gloom, Sisters of Mercy, you know, my shtick and i'm like i walk up to them and i look at them they look at me and i'm like what's the name of your band and he goes save your machine and i i, I went ah! and i just laughed fell on the ground laughed because no one else knew what he was talking about yeah that's how we met and uh we've been really good friends since all right anything else Where are we on all this? Okay, so uh, we go into the recording studio and we record Sin Disease. And um, there you go. That's how that started. That's the truth. That's the story right there. And Omar and I don't get along with about, oh, I'm going to say 80% <laughs> of stuff. And uh, we're telling you the same thing. This is, how it ha this is how it played out. This is how it happened. Here's some bass trivia about uh, Sin Disease. My bass has two pickups, bridge and um, neck. And the neck pickup had uh, malfunction. So that whole album was recorded on just the bridge pickup. Oh, my gosh. Jim Worthen. And I didn't even know it didn't work. What? Do you remember Jim Worthen? You have yes. to remember Jim Worthen. Why? Why Because he worked that? for Frontline. He, was wor he worked our album. Oh, Jim Worthen says, 35 years in the music industry, because he went from frontline to tooth and nail. 35 years in the music industry. This is Jim Worthen speaking, an industry professional. This guy is like an industry expert. 35 years in the music industry, and Scattered Few is still a top five live band for me, period. Oh. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. You don't remember Jim? Thank you, Jim, so much. That's very kind of you to say. Um, yeah, it we, took three weeks to record Sin Disease, Chris Edmonds. Three weeks. Well, we tracked Back it. Now. We tracked it all in 24 hours, I think, bass and drums. And then we did overdubs. Up, because, because we needed we had, we had needed another song. So Alan says, you know what? Let's do a reggae song. Sam wasn't very versed in reggae at oh, the I time. Oh, I played the drums, yeah. And so he goes into the studio and just plays to drum. a click track to a click track to a click track there's no no music chords, no nothing. nothing just just you know just playing just yep. played the drums for the last two 
three minutes Whatever. of tape that we had left. Yeah. Right? Yeah. No music. Just me and a we click track. A, we took a cassette of that home. And wrote a song over the drums. We wrote a song over that. Right? The whole, the, the you know, the bass line for Freedom Cry, all of that. We, you know, we came up with that that night. Yeah. Went back to the studio the next day. And tracked it. And, and Terry was mm -hmm. like, how? Mm -hmm. You know, he was like, it reminds me of uh, the story of, um, and of course, I'm not equating myself to the Beatles. Okay, so everybody calm down. Everybody calm down. But um, it's like when they went into the studio and, um, and, and Ringo said, uh, it's a, you know, it was a hard day's night. Because they had and then, and then like, John went, and then John, and then John goes, they needed, a, they needed a title track. Oh, my gosh. So John and... and uh, Paul, they came up with a hard day's night that night and came back the next day and laid it out. All right, we got Sometimes some good couple of really we got we got a couple of really good questions here. Talk about Kill the Sarks Apocalypse. But first, okay, go to Bandcamp, 25% off with the FGRC25 promo code till midnight tonight. Don't forget, we have merchandise at Anchor. At Anchor, somebody put a. Uh, we have scattered few merch. Somebody put the link up there. Um, but first, I want to answer this question: How did you meet Gene Eugene? I th we went to go see Undercover Live with Adam again, and I remember meeting Gene in line because we were going to be on the guest list. So, so, so the undercover guys came out with Gene. We were, I th that's how I, I remember being introduced to Gene. Was um, they were doing a show at an Adam, uh, Adam again, and uh, and I think undercover or something weird like that. That's how I was, remember meeting Gene. And then he was in engineering during season. Right. And then I would see him, right? Then that was, but I'm talking about like 1980. Yeah, before that, yeah. In the early 80s. And so, and then as the years went by, I would see him every once in a while. And then when we started working with Terry again in 89, he brought in Gene and it would just instant. Gene Eugene would, so we would hire, right? We would, we would hire Gene as an engineer because him and Terry were a team back then. A phenomenal team and and so gene we're paying you know right so we're essentially paying gene to record our albums well it would got it got to the point where gene would be on the payroll to record our albums and he would come he would take me aside and go hey ronald because remember he was the only that guy he, he was the only guy that never learned how to call me alan and he was the only guy that got the, the free pass he called me ronald until literally literally the day he died and yeah, but he would go, hey, Ronald, I'm going to go to a, he was all about baseball. If you know Gene, he was all about his baseball. So he would take me aside. We would be in the middle of making a record, and he'd take me aside. Hey, uh, I'm going to go to a baseball game. Can I pay you to engineer your session, <laughs> for you to engineer your own session? Yeah, he would want to pay me to, re to engineer my own session. I'm like, no, you don't have to pay me. I'll take care of it. You know, and he'd go off to a baseball game and then come back and would still be working. Yeah, that would ha that happened a that happened like probably three times on two different records or something crazy. Oh my gosh, Ricky Michelle. Well, he was married to Ricky Michelle. He, it was his idea to bring her into the studio to sing that part on Freedom Cry that they spent. They went. It was just the two of them in the studio. Yeah, we and weren't allowed. He, he produced her doing that part for that song, and it was on tape, and he, then we were allowed in the room, and he goes, what do you think? And we're like, damn, thank you for loving us so much. <laughs> it was so good. Man. No, and you know what? Other, the, here's the other mind blower. The Ricky Michelle background vocal was a mind blower, and then the Terry Taylor sitting down with our little brother Drew on keyboard. How old was Drew in 91? Well, I was 25, so he was like 18. So, right? So, Terry Taylor and Drew alone for a couple hours by themselves in the studio as Terry produced him the parts for A Look Into My Side, which are amazing. That's Terry and Drew together came up with those string parts, keyboard string parts for Look Into My Side. And then we got to come in and go, and you go, all right, what do you think? And it was like, oh, my gosh. Are you kidding me? That's on our song? <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> That's funny. Well, what else? So we got we didn't get hacked. People just started commenting and redirecting people to a fake account where people were giving their credit card numbers. They were being scammed in the in the comment sections. Man, such a bummer. What a bunch of um, I don't use any bass effects. Chris Edmonds. Well, when he Why? was on looking, would put chorus on his bass. Yeah, they would put chorus on it or, you know, sometimes I'll use, I have a couple of mini pedals and one of them is a reverb and the other one is a phase shifter or chorus. And so I'll, I'll put that on sometimes to mess around, but I really don't use effects. It's all in the hands, man. But yeah, I like, I like phase shifter chorus. I need to get a, I want to get a, you know, your classic Octavate. I used to have one, but you know, that was years and years and years and years ago. And I need to get a new one because I want to, I, I like, uh, I like, I like that sound. And plus, you know, you can't really do sledgehammer unless you have one. Anything Tony else? Are we still talking? Influence. Chorus, I knew it. You have to put bass, you have to put chorus on a fretless bass. There's just no, no other way. There's no other way. Round because wound or flat you're, wound. If, when you're playing, you can create, you can create those tensions with, with subtones. So I'm being asked a, a Spyglass Blue question. Uh, you had three different band lineups and they're pretty different albums. Was that intentional? Well, Shadows and, and Shadows and Loud as Feathers are pretty much the same guy. It's the same drummer, same bass player. Josh Pyle is involved. So it's essentially the same band, just a different guitarist. Uh, circumstantial. Blue EP, completely circumstantial. Yeah. And we do plan on doing a new Spyglass Blue. We, that is going to happen. Well, God willing, that is a plan. We are planning on doing that. And it will have the same drummer that I know of. So, so who decided the cover of Sin Disease? Like the, the cover artwork? Well, basically the Frontline Records art department copped some of the designs my brother and I were doing, we would come up with these like newsletters, like these little scatter few fanzines that we would have on our table at shows. There's actual photos of them. And they actually literally took the idea of one of them and tried to repurpose it. I, I've never liked the cover. The cover, I think they should Allow me to decode, decode for you. I, I don't like says, this. My brother, he means Drew. Yeah, Drew. So first of all, they, I, I don't have a shirt in real life. They drew a shirt on me. But so, when, so when, on the 25th anniversary, I got, I got to do this. This is the picture I wanted on the cover. That one. That looks stronger than this. And I told them, think of Houses of the Holy and do a, like a, you know, a paint treatment on it. I think that's an amazing photo. I like that cover better, that picture better. But well, hey, what do I know? <laughs> what do I know? What say so do I have? So to answer but, your string question, um, usually round wounds, um, GHS, medium gauge, boomers. Um, but I have been using um, flat, not flat wound, um, pressure wound. So it doesn't eat up the neck as much. Did you guys ever record or work with Gene or at the green room? Well, yes. All the overdubs were done in Studio B. So oh, there you go. Studio B became the green room. Studio B was frontline studio that Gene ran, and then Gene bought it, and it became the green room. So um, all of Syndesis overdubs were done with Gene in the green room. And then when we did our first version of Jawbone, it was with Terry and Gene in the green room with Mike Knott, his blonde vinyl label. And then he, that didn't work out very well. The first time we recorded it was on a Harrison board. Oh my gosh, that board was amazing. 
And then we were with Gene on a Trident, I believe. And then we did it at Naughty Pine with um, Mark Rodriguez. Well, that is the 40th anniversary story. We're sticking to it. It's documented. Forty years. Uh, yeah, and, and no, we no, we will. There is absolutely no plan, intention, or anything of the sort to write new Scatterfew music, put out a Scatterfew record, tour, gig, Naja. I because I saw that somewhere in the the questions. Yeah. No, Romeo I'm, I'm going to be what? Just, I'm just saying Romeo Void. So yeah, I, I I mean I am actively looking at I I mean I have a studio, so we are going I am going to do a uh, instrumental ambient worship album, some new spy a new spyglass and a new ministries walking. That is on my to do list, and you will see new and uh, reoccurring actors in those in those uh, thingamajiggers. Omar, any uh, anything else you want to add to the fortieth anniversary, man? Forty years. We started this band forty years ago, man. Uh, yes, I played the Carvin LB seventy on Sin Disease. There you go. That was a question that's on this little window that I have here. Yep, yep, yep. Um, crazy wild ride. I mean, I'm still I'm still super blessed that so many people are even to this day blessed by right? that album. I mean, I uh, I really enjoy Jawbone. Um, hey, I froze. I really enjoy Jawbone because I think that the the um, my bass sound is more true to what it really is. But that doesn't mean that Sin Disease doesn't sound like yeah. me. Um, but you know, Jawbone was just a progression of of, of the band at the time. Um, but again, it just trips me out and I, it's humbling to be involved in something that um, affected so many people in the time that it did. I mean, you, we could have never predicted it. We could have never have thought, you know, it was going to do that. I mean, we were just, we were just trying to make a living as musicians, you know, really. I mean, that's, that's what it all boiled down to. Yeah. And, uh, trippy that it did so as it did yeah you know, so music man, yeah, I, like i'm sorry what no i said i'm just glad people still oh, like it yeah music man i i know about that i've mentioned i i said hello they didn't sound very interested to have us involved having us involved I think requires people to have to rewrite their narrative. They like they like their cushy little, neat little package of a narrative. We interrupt that narrative. So, you know, what, what are you going to do? Uh, how did the vinyl and CD happen? Um, I was I was told that the that this that retroactive was interested in working with me, and I reached out to them, and it has been one of the most pleasurable deals i've ever had or uh, or i've been a part of you know it's a licensing deal it's a they i think i think they've done an incredible job this was their idea i think this is an amazing idea i'm i, I can't be any happier i mean come on this is freaking rock star stuff um it's i am i mean cd this is back on cd my entire catalog is on vinyl because I got the Cindas, the, uh, the Spyglass Blue albums over there. Um, it's been absolutely amazing to work with Matthew. Um, thank you so much. And no one's been able to... Uh... Wait, wait, wait. The Metal Priest, Signier Tunes. Look into my side, bigger, as the story grows. You got two out of three! You got two out of three. All right, Metal Priest, can you... Uh... Somehow give us your information so we can send you. Your, I, I, we have to give it to you. No one's even bothered to, uh, to, to even guess. You got two out of the three. So uh, Metal Priest, if, can you 
get a hold of us privately instead of publicly and let us get your, uh, your, your contact information? Let's try that. Um, yeah, you got two out of three. Look into my side as the story grows. Those are the two off sin disease. There's one off of uh, jawbone. So, so if it's David Priest, yeah, you know, you have my personal. Go ahead and send me a message personally. Yeah, yeah, or fa Facebook Messenger. Yeah, <laughs> take care of it, people. Um, yeah. So that, yeah, cool. Anything else, Omar? Anything else? Anything going on? No. I yeah, I, 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 I agree with Music Man that it would be foolish not to include us. But what are you gonna do, man? I mean, well, people, yeah, but it's like, people, uh, people really don't like the fact that they're that somebody else was the first. You know, that was probably one of the most complimentary, absolutely respectful things ever done. I know where and you're that going. Was, huh? I know where you're going. And that was Mark Solomon's show, right? Never was. Mark Solomon had a podcast called Never Was. And when he interviewed me for the Scattered Few story, he said, I never was first. <laughs> and that was very respectful of him. He knows the history. People try to rewrite the history. People try to convince me that U2 was punk rock. I laugh in their general direction. Do you remember, um, shoot, I'm forgetting the name of the label. But they did their their documentary, and in the beginning of it. Oh yeah, Tooth and Nail. Tooth and Nail honored us I with mean, a mention. That's a nod. That's with a, nod. a mention, a... and we were never on Tooth and Nail. But they can't cool. deny that if it wasn't for what we did. Yeah, that was that was a, that was an amazing tribute. I, I mean, that was very respectful of them to do. I, so. I thought that was a very yeah. cool nod to us. Because but the, but, Brandon, but but see, here's the thing: Brandon's a real guy. He has nothing. He, he's not. He, he we're not a threat to him. See, yeah. but if you're a poser and if you're playing make believe, eh, we we're probably a bit of a threat. I should probably stop talking now. I I think I've done a damn good job tonight of being very diplomatic about a whole bunch of damn things, including drinking publicly. Woo, cheers to another 40 years. Yeah, another 40 freaking years. <laughs> wow, Alan, you ever think we'll get that Dove Award? Oh, my God. Maybe you and I can reconcile our differences and make a record <laughs> in another 40 years. <laughs> what band do you fantasize or, or, collaborating or in with? About a, or in about a year. Hence, oh Romeo Boyd. Have I met Bono? No. You know, I would have been nice to have met Bono in the early 80s. Nowadays, I think I would just freaking punch his liberal throat and punch him in the, his liberal throat. Uh, what band do you fantasize collaborating with? Would it be weird if I said Taylor Swift? I'm just kidding. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. I got, a, I got something for that. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Oh, 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 oh. <sighs> I don't think I, what band do I fantasize collaborating with? I can't think of. I can't think of a band that I would want to fantasize I mean, collaborating just, with. As as a musician, for me, I would like to just play with anyone if they wanted me to to you know jam with them, play with them, do a collaboration, whatever. I mean, I'm just because it's fun, and it doesn't have to be my genre of music. It's just a blast to just to just do it. It's all fine. I, I don't, I don't, well, for one, I don't fantasize about collaborating with a band. Um, you know, you know what? I, I would have, I would love to sing on some of these. Well, it's too late now. It's been six years. It's well, way overdue, but maybe first, the like, first year or two. Um, yeah, my, my wife, <laughs> my wife just called it. She just texted me exactly what I was about to say. I would have, I would love, I would have loved the first year or two to have sang on some of those Bowie tributes with Gail Ann Dorsey on bass, Zachary Ashford on drums, my buddy Mark Platty on guitar, Mike Garson on keyboard. I would have loved to have sang maybe on some of those uh, Bowie tribute things, but that was just, that's not going to happen. Um, but uh, if, if, if to answer the question, 
But I did collaborate with David Bowie's last musical director, Mark Platty. That was a few years ago. And uh, that, was, that was about the most affirming thing that's ever happened to me. Yeah. You didn't see me put a press release out about that now, did you? Oh, oh yeah. Are you hearing that? <laughs> yeah. Trying to now, we're, now we're just getting silly. Spice Girls, yes! Oh, man, Spice Girls. We, used to, we did a cover. Was it a Spyglass Blue cover that we did? Well, we used to do... Uh, uh, what song did we used to do? People of the world. Da na 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 People around the world. Everybody everywhere. Ah. What song was that? It was a Spice Girl song. Where are my daughters? Spice up your life. Spice up your life, Alicia. That was an awesome song, man. Thank you, Ian and Alyssa. That was amazing. I love that song. That was it was so much oh, fun man. to play. Okay, now we're getting silly. Now we're now we're, now it's becoming redundant. Thank you very much. Hey, don't forget uh, the song that you forgot was uh, "Holding Stare" on Jawbone. That was a definitely a Signe song. Um, don't forget go to Anchor. Put up the can you put up the links to Anchor? Uh, scatter a few merchandise and don't forget. FGRC25, that's the code over at Bandcamp. Till midnight tonight, you'll get 25% off your entire order. Uh, we have new, I have uh, plans for new Spyglass and new Ministries Walking. Um, I, I wish I could say, you know, I tried, but it didn't work out. I wish I could say there was something happening with Sp Scattered, but just ain't going to happen. And uh, what else? You're welcome. Thank you, Omar, for... Uh, Taking time away from your very important and busy schedule. My very, very busy life. Oh, my God. Thank you for taking time from your reset. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. That's hilarious. Here, here, here. Hey, I, do I have I a... Think great day to quit doing heroin. I, I think I have an outro. Do I have an outro for everybody? Uh, we'll try. What did you say about heroin? Airplane. The movie. Oh, I don't I know, man. Of, taking amphetamines. I yeah, don't forget tip your waitress. Okay. Do it again in another 40 years. I agree. Another 40 years. Hey, Laheim, to another 40 years. Ching. No? It's... The views and opinions expressed during our broadcasts are solely those of the broadcast producers, hosts, and or guests and are not necessarily the views or opinions of the Travelog Network, its sponsors, or affiliates.
Yeah.